Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Our talk here is going to be on Neisseria meningitidis, the second of our Neisseria species um, that are very, very high yield for your exam. We're going to talk about two very important diseases, more high yield for step two and three, but it does come up on step one, and then we'll talk about virulence factors and that stuff, which is high yield pretty much only for step one. If you haven't had the opportunity yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. I got the link below in the description of the video, or you can click on the I button on the upper right hand corner. If you consider chipping in a dollar a month, a little bit goes a long way to help keep these videos free and coming and offset the cost of creating them. Uh, so thank you very much in advance for your consideration. Now let's get to our material here. Uh, you need to know the difference between a gram-positive cell wall and a gram-negative cell wall for step one. So I have, a, I have two overview videos, one on gram-positive and one on gram-negative. If you're not familiar with this, please go back and watch that because it's very high yield for your step. Uh, you should be familiar with the gram stain. Uh, not only that gram-positive is purple and gram-negative is red and pink, uh, but why it stains that way, and that's part and parcel of the cell walls. We're going to talk about our classification, run through the algorithm. Again, you want to know that cold, both gram-positive and gram-negative algorithms. We'll talk about the characteristics of N. meningitidis, and then we'll talk about a couple diseases that come out of this, which are very, very high yield for all of your steps. Here's our algorithm here. So we're talking about gram-negative diplococci. These are just paired cocci. They're together in little pairs. Um, the first thing you want to ask yourself when you're talking about gram-negative diplococci is does it ferment maltose? Neisseria meningitis ferments maltose and glucose, whereas Neisseria gonorrhea does not ferment maltose, it only ferments glucose. Um, all right, so there's one more, Morax cataralis. I don't know if I'm going to make a video on that because it's just not super common, not high yield at all on, on your exam, but maybe I'll make one later. Okay, so the characteristics of Neisseria meningitidis, uh, what does it share in common with Neisseria gonorrhea? Well, they're both gram-negative diplococci, they're both oxidase positive, they're both aerobic, they're both, uh, they both grow inside cells, and they both grow on Thayer Martin auger. And I talk about Thayer Martin auger uh, in the overview video of Neisseria, but you should be familiar with it that it's selective for Neisseria. So if you're trying to grow Neisseria in the lab, use Thayer Martin auger. Neisseria meningitidis is encapsulated. Please remember that. That is different from Neisseria gonorrhea, which is not encapsulated. And the cool thing about it being encapsulated, even though that helps it evade the immune system, we can create a vaccine for Neisseria meningitidis. And so we have a vaccine that we give for kids, particularly kids going into college, to help protect them against meningococcal meningitis. You might see these on commercials if you're in the U.S. Uh, that advertise for this vaccine. There are four serogroups that are common uh, for the, the capsule. You don't need to be familiar with that, but they will come up when we talk about the vaccine. It is part of the normal flora in the nasopharynx in about 10% of people. It doesn't really cause any problems, though. Virulence factors. So I talk about this in the overview video. Uh, but remember, it's got an IgA protease. That helps it grow on mucosal surfaces. Remember, IgA is the predominant antibody on mucosal surfaces, prevents bacteria from growing on the surfaces. Uh, and so the protease cleaves that IgA dimer and prevents it from working. Lipoligosaccharide is also another characteristic of the Neisseria species. This is an endotoxin. It creates an immune response, and that can lead to sepsis. Adhesins. There are both pili and fimbriae. They have antigenic variation. Why is that important? Because we can't use those to create a vaccine because there's just too many of there's too many combinations. So if you get one Neisseria meningitidis or Neisseria gonorrhea infection, you can get it again and again and again because uh, if if you don't have antibodies against, uh, I mean, if, if you've got antibodies against uh, one infection, you get another infection with different antigens uh, on the pili because of the variation. So 
that antigenic variation helps it evade uh, the immune system even though you're getting repeated bouts of infection. And then we've got the polysaccharide capsule that's unique to Neisseria meningitidis and that helps it evade phagocytosis but it also helps us create a vaccine. Distinction from Neisseria gonorrhea is that it's encapsulated and that Neisseria meningitidis ferments, okay this should say it ferments glucose and maltose. Glucose and maltose. So gonorrhea is glucose only, GG. Meningitidis is maltose too, MM. Okay, so gonorrhea, glucose only, meningitis, maltose, and glucose. Here are our diseases. So the big one, meningococcal meningitis. This is a big problem, big problem. And this is meningitis, so it's meningeal inflammation, and it's due to hematogenous spread. It colonizes the nasopharynx, uh, acquired by respiratory droplets, and then spreads through the blood, ultimately into the meninges. There is an increased risk in patients that are in close quarters. So here, think about college kids in dorms, military recruits in barracks, uh, think of uh, prisoners. Uh, if, if anyone living in very close quarters, they're at increased risk for meningococcal meningitis. This presents very fulminantly. Very abrupt onset of fever, you get your meningeal signs, neck pain, uh, they become tired, lethargic, and they get this characteristic rash, which happens in about 80% of patients. This will be given to you on the exam. So it's a petechial uh, sort of purple rash uh, that shows up on the skin. So you've got a patient coming in very suddenly sick. They're running a fever, and they've got a rash, especially if it's a younger person or someone in the military. Think of meningococcal meningitis. This progresses very rapidly to sepsis. Uh, and it's very deadly. Even if these patients recover, they can develop permanent neurologic damage. So speaking difficulties, uh, visual changes, hearing loss, uh, you name it. The diagnosis is CSF analysis. So you get a lumbar puncture, look at the CSF, analyze it. You need to know how to distinguish bacterial meningitis from, fu from fungal meningitis and viral meningitis. And so I put a, a table uh, on here, it'll be on the, the next slide. You need to know that cold because that will be asked of you on any three of the steps. You'll need to be familiar with that. You also wanna get blood cultures. Remember that N meningitis is spread through the blood. So if they've got it in the blood, they're at risk for sepsis. They probably already have it. So get blood cultures. CBC is useful. Uh, coagulation panel is useful. Remember, they're septic, so they can get DIC. The treatment is threefold. Ceftriaxone, vancomycin, and methylprednisolone. So you want to use all three. Why do we use all three? Well, because we don't know if it's meningococcal. Uh, we don't want to wait to determine exactly what organism it is. So this is the empiric treatment for bacterial meningitis. It covers everything. It's the ceftriaxone here that's really getting at the Neisseria. So ceftriaxone and vancomycin, why do we use methylprednisolone? Why are we giving a steroid? Well, a steroid helps reduce the inflammation. So we've got the antibiotics going after the infection, and we've got the steroid going after the inflammation. It's the inflammation that's known to aggravate damage to the nervous system uh, and, and cause possibly some of those neurologic, permanent neurologic uh, deficits. So we want to use methylprednisolone. That'll come up on step two and three. I doubt it'll come up on step one. Here's something that will come up on step one on any of the steps. Treat close contacts with prophylactic rifampin. So you got a patient who's in college, you got to treat their roommates. You got a, uh, a, a, a patient who is in the military, treat anyone that's in their barracks. You got a patient who's maybe in a house, treat everyone in that household. And we use rifampin. Now remember how rifampin works if you're taking step one, that it inhibits bacterial DNA dependent RNA polymerase. Remember that's the, that's the enzyme that helps you uh, create an RNA uh, template out of your, your DNA, so for uh, transcription. And that, that can be high yield for step one. Next, we've got waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome. This is a favorite of the test writers. This is due to sepsis, and it's bilateral adrenal hemorrhagic necrosis of the adrenal glands. And that results 
in adrenal failure, primary adrenal insufficiency. And so what will happen with these patients is that they come in with a, a meningococcal infection picture, and then maybe they get better, but now they're still having signs of shock, like hypotension and uh, lethargy. And you take a look at their, their, their electrolytes, and you find that they've got hyponatremia and hyperkalemia and maybe a metabolic acidosis. What's that a sign of? That's a sign of aldosterone deficiency. Remember, aldosterone helps you take up sodium at the expense of potassium. It also pumps out hydrogen into your urine. So the result of that is that you're going to get hyponatremia and hyperkalemia and a metabolic acidosis. You see that in association with a patient that's just had meningococcal meningitis uh, or perhaps having it. That is a sign of waterhouse friedrichsen syndrome. This comes up on the exam all the time, so know this. To diagnose this, CT, visualize the adrenal glands, you can see the hemorrhage. Another way that this can be diagnosed is through the cosyntropin stimulation test. What this is, is you're giving a, uh, a, a compound that uh, simulates ACTH, and you're looking to see if their cortisol levels go up, if the adrenals are responding. And of course, because the adrenals are hemorrhagically necrosed, they're not going to respond, so you won't get an increase in cortisol. And that is uh, indicative of primary adrenal insufficiency. The treatment for this, well, there's there's no cure, uh, so we have to just give replacements. You give glucocorticoids and mineralocorticoids, and they're going to be on that for life. Remember your CSF analysis. So I'm not going to go over this here, uh, but you want to know this for your exam. Step one, two, and three, you got to know. Uh, you got to know these, particularly know bacterial and viral. So the big ones uh, to remember are that your white count is going to be very high in bacterial, not so much in viral. Uh, and then the glucose is low in bacterial, but normal in viral. And the way I remember that is that bacteria eat sugar, so uh, it's going to be lower in bacterial. The protein is going to be higher in bacterial because bacteria, just like all cells, are full of protein. Viruses are not. Okay, so remember this for your exam because this will be very high yield. Okay, now you can stop if you're uh, if you just want to know your stuff for step one. But if you're taking step two or three, or you want to really impress your attendings, it's good to know uh, about the vaccination for meningococcal disease. So we do have two different vaccines that we give for prevention of meningococcal disease, and we give both of them. One of them is a little bit newer. So the older one uh, is for primarily for meningitis A, and it is given as a two-dose series in adolescence. So typically in like middle school, you'll give the first dose around 11 to 12 years, and then the second dose in high school, uh, and that will uh, protect them. Now you can give this much earlier. You can give it in toddlerhood uh, if they are high risk for meningococcal disease. So who's high risk? Anyone without a working spleen, so think sickle cell disease, uh, splenectomy, for whatever reason. And then remember terminal complement deficiency. Remember that membrane attack complex is very important for fighting off Neisserial infections. So uh, if they have a terminal complement deficiency, you want to give the vaccination to them early on. And then if they're on a complement inhibitor, remember that's used for paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. It inhibits C5 and prevents lysis of red blood cells. Probably not high yield for exam purposes, but there it is. Now there's another vaccine that's recently become available for meningitis B. Uh, this is obviously a different uh, form of the capsule. Uh, and so this is given typically around 16 to 18. Uh, right before these kids go off to college or the military. And so this is an additional vaccine in addition to this other vaccine uh, that we give earlier on. And then, of course, remember for the prevention of meningococcal disease, we give rifampin uh, in people who are close contacts of patients that have confirmed meningococcal infection. And that is all I've got for you.